Howdy, kids. It's me, Bob Harris, Senior Editor, FootballDieHards.com. Time for the weekly Ask Me Anything. I see the questions are coming in, and we have some people here. We'll dive right in. Just uh, back from a weekend off that wasn't really a weekend off. Went to the uh, Fantasy Football Expo in Canton, Ohio, uh, which has uh, become an amazing experience. And uh, I'm still trying to figure out how I'm three and a half days away. Leaves me a week behind when I get back. It's scrambling to get back. Oh, and lots of things going on. And I can see from some of your questions. First, Scott Kobe, hello. The cats are fine. They survived my absence somehow. I'm very surprised by that. Never expect them to be okay. Uh, they're always okay. So thanks for asking. Really great time. Bob Long uh, putting together that FF Expo. Did the King's Classic drafts and had a great time in those. Uh, fared reasonably well, uh, even though it doesn't feel like it in the moment because they're 14 team leagues. I kept joking with people after the fact. They'd walk up to me right after the draft. How was your draft? Go, well, it was 14 teams. Not great. But it was great. It was actually a lot better than I thought. And, you know, you can go find those on the King's Classic uh, timeline on my Twitter timeline. Find the retweets. So the questions are coming in hot and heavy. And some of the first, very first question from Deadweight19 is something I talked about on Sirius Radio last night, by the way, football diehards. Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on the weeknights right now. Uh, so uh, it's interesting. He wants to know, Deadweight19 asks, how much credence do I have in Frank Reich's comments about Jonathan Taylor's workload uh, this year? And uh, so, you know, is talking to people who cover the team on a daily basis and reading some of the work, I think everyone thinks they want to dial him back a little bit. Is it going to be a significant amount? Probably not. He's still the best player in that offense. There are some going to be some – will they pass a little more? I mean, Matt Ryan wrote really promising reports, by the way. Uh, multiple observers, Zach Keeper from The Athletic, uh, the Indianapolis Star, all, you know, crowing about Michael Pittman and his progress this year and how he's hitting it off with Matt Ryan. But here's the thing on on uh, Taylor. I mean, he's not so much – like, so has, has, has the talk moved me off him as my 101? I think that's the real question. So, and it really hasn't. I mean, you know, if anything, Christian McCaffrey's gaining a little momentum uh, because look, you, you know, you're drafting one. And I, and so here's the, the <clears throat> how you split that hair, right? Christian McCaffrey has the huge upside, the 30 points per game. We know uh, when he's healthy, he's also missed 23 games. 
Uh, Jonathan Taylor doesn't miss games. And he also is not without upside, right? We saw it last year, week 11 against Buffalo. He scored 50-plus points. He had 30-plus points three times. Averaged 21 points. <clears throat> Still giving you tremendous leverage over the field, or at least really good leverage over the field. Not player and a half leverage. Not what you're getting with Christian McCaffrey, but damn good. And you feel a little more confident. I talked to Jonathan Taylor as he headed into his rookie season in the NFL. And uh, he was reminding myself and Mike Dempsey, my co-host on uh, the Football Diehards, that he never missed a game in college. Not only did he never miss a game, he never missed a practice. So he thinks it's nonsense, all this talk about, you know, an extensive workload being an issue. I'm sure Derek Henry would tell you the same. And, you know, players do get hurt. But I think if you're looking at it, to me, and I'm injury agnostic. I try to ignore injury history unless, so, <clears throat> so let me stipulate here. There's the difference between chronic injuries and chronically injured. Right? I want to keep stressing that. If someone has the same issue over and over, let's say Dalvin Cook has certain injuries, the shoulder seems to be an ongoing issue or a recurring issue, then it's a little bit more concerning. But if it's like random things, as it's been the case with McCaffrey, then I try not to get too caught up in it, and I hope he has better luck uh, because I want that upside. But still, Taylor gives you a fair amount of that upside without as much concern right, or as much baggage, history behind it. So I'm still going with Taylor and I don't think the workload's going to diminish to the point. Look, he's still a great big play, you know, big play threat. Had some plays, I think on 15 per, 15% of his carries, I want to say. Uh, that was second in the NFL. So, and he has some receiving equity as well. Naheem Hines is going to play a greater role, but no, I'm not dialing back dead weight if that uh, uh to put a fine point on it and uh and <clears throat> and I do think, you know, that I mentioned it seems like Christian McCaffrey's gaining a little momentum. Maybe not with all of you. And that's okay, right? So I'm advocating for players that I love or that I love the upside or that my style suit my style of play. That doesn't mean it has to be your style of play. It doesn't have to suit your style of play. We're here to have a conversation about these things and give you the context necessary to make those best decisions in line with what you want to do, right? This is your team. I'm going to be there and talk to you every week, be here and talk to you every week, and I'm going to be at the website, and I'm going to be on the radio. I'm going to be offering my advice. You are free to take it or not. What I'd like you to do is put it in context of what you think. We're not here to say I'm smarter than you. We're not here to say, you know, I know more than you. What, and maybe I do because I'm immersed in it every day and I know more of the nuance and the intricacies. But, man, this is your team. You're playing fantasy football. You're the boss of this. So Mondays when you're sitting there kicking yourself in the ass, I'm not going to be there to help, right? You're going to be the one who has to deal with it. So make your choices based on what you want to do. But take this information in that context and work with it there. Rob Lenahan, Bob, he says, I have the seventh pick in a 10-man TD heavy league. I really like Connor. Running back uh, James Connor is 14 to, too early. No, 14 is not too early for me. I mean, maybe the 10 pound. I mean, I think he could probably last until 26. I mean, he does in 12 teams, right? I get it. So this is something, if you go to the website, footballdiehards.com, and you sign up for the August update, use the promo code DIEHARDS to get a 15% discount if you're not already signed up. Use the stop tool. It helps you identify players, creates a ranking, and gives you a little bit of a map of when to jump up a little bit over ADP based on your roster settings. So, um, But I would say in a 12-team league, he's probably lasting that long. Let me bring up my ADP and just see where, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to be going with the latest NFFC ADP uh, for our conversations here today. These are aggressive players, you know, high-end players. He's going pick 33 overall in a 12 team. So you could probably wait on him. But if you know people in your league who are keen on him, look, I love him. You look at him last year uh, when he had the clear path to workload when Chase Edmonds was out, I think for six games, Mike Clay from ESPN pointed this out. Uh, Connor was number two in, the, in fantasy, number two running back in fantasy for those six games, uh, right behind Jonathan Taylor. The workload was there. It's an explosive offense. He gets tons of looks. In scoring position, one yard line, goal to go, whatever. Uh, so I really like him too. 14 might be too early, especially in a, in a 10 team league, but it is TD heavy and people are going to be chasing those. Always with TDs, they're volatile. You're taking your chances a little bit, right? So, uh, so keep that in mind as well. But if you feel like in your league you need to jump up, don't be afraid to. You want your guys, right? JJM picking number four tonight, Eckler or Henry? If it's a choice between the two for me, I've been going Henry. That probably means I'm an old person. I mean, even in even even in uh, PPR scoring, you know, we know Henry doesn't give you the receiving equity that Eckler will. He never will, right? That's Eckler's stock and trade. The thing that worries me about Eckler, and I've talked about this before on the radio and on this these live streams and on podcasts, 
is, you know, again, the touchdown total last year was phenomenal. 20 touchdowns, right? 12 of those rushing, 12 of those were rushing touchdowns. That's nine more rushing touchdowns than he's ever had before. Maybe some of this depends on if they get a viable Melvin Gordon style player to jump into the mix. Joshua Kelly is currently now firmly in the number two as the reporting out of Los Angeles. Uh, Isaiah Spiller was highly regarded as a rookie coming in this year, and he's yet to gain any momentum. And look, to, to be fair, the Chargers have swung and missed the last three, two years, previous two years. Maybe Kel Kelly's going to finally, you know, turn into the thing they draft him to be. I can remember Matt Waldman from the rookie scouting portfolio, who I pay a lot of attention to, is really high on Kelly. So maybe he's finally putting it all together. Uh, but for me, it's Henry, right? And so again, looking for leverage over the field. Let's look back to last year and most any year when he was hurt i think he had well over 200 carries eight weeks into the season putting him on a, a an unbelievable rate right but he was also about 40 fantasy points ahead of the field at the time he went down right so i'm looking for that kind of leverage i'm willing to take a little risk for me eckler also has some injury history and by the way i talk about that injury agnosticity i realize not everyone's into that you don't have to be into that but you have to be aware that anyone and everyone can get hurt in fantasy football, in NFL football. And it's so disappointing when it happens and it leaves a horrible taste in our mouth. And I'm hoping to leverage those things. I'm getting Henry later in drafts. I had Curtis Patrick from Rotoviz on the Football Diehards radio program last night. We talked about this as well. You know, we remember the last thing we saw, right? And Henry wasn't good the last we saw him. But the workload was there, right? But he was just coming off the injury in the playoff game against Cincinnati. I think you could say the same thing about Cam Akers. We didn't really like the production we had, but we liked the workload he saw he saw coming back from the Achilles last year. But for me, Henry is – so my top three backs uh, in any format are Taylor, McCaffrey, and Henry. And it's taking everything I can to move – to not move McCaffrey ahead of Taylor. I, look, again, I love the 30-point-a-game upside, and that's what he's averaged per game when healthy since 2019. So – so there's my top three. So Eckler is down a little lower. I'd probably go into the wide receivers after I get through, get past Henry. I like Najee Harris a little better. One of my concerns with Eckler, like I totally get that, that he outproduced this last year and he has outproduced it before. But he's the one who's pushing the notion that he doesn't want as many touches as he, as he gets. He, you know, last year was what, over 200 carries. It's not really what he thinks is his ideal. He thinks he wants to dial back. So, so I'm fine with him. I think he does have that running back one upside there. We've seen it. I mean, he firmly is. I have him ranked as such, right? I'm as my running back six, so it's not like I'm down on him. Just higher on Henry. ICB fans, seven, Dynasty Standard League. I have the 101, 104, 105, 108, 109, 202, 209. I need a running back. Breeze for sure and hoping for Walker. But in terms of wide receiver, should I buy into the uh, Sky Moore Pickens moves? Yes, you should draft everybody. You have every damn pick. Well done. That's how you, that's how you set yourself up for success, by golly. ICB fan seven, <clears throat> Mike Dempsey somewhere is cheering you on. Um, but yes, I, I would buy into the, the Pickens looks amazing. I mean, it's a matter of time. Maybe it's not this year. And same with Sky Moore. I mean, he's currently running as the fourth teamer and, and Pickens is not running with the, the first team offense, but he will at times and uh, looks like a great playmaker. Steven Pavia. And again, man, that's an amazing haul. I'm not sure how you pulled it off, but kudos to you. Steven Pavia or Pavia. In the 12-team redraft league, I have choice of 7th, 8th, or 10th draft position. What would be your preference, and can you expound on your reasoning? So in all these cases, what you need to do whenever you're choosing your draft pick is try to think a little bit ahead of what you're going to get. I think, it, you know, all those picks I've had, um, I'm a little, I feel a little better towards the end of drafts, but I don't know if that's far enough to the end of the draft it makes me feel better. I might want to be dead in the middle. And I think if you're talking about, you know, what can your expectations be, I'm going to try and pull up a, a draft that I've done recently that puts me in the, uh, that had me in the middle and kind of see how it plays out. But the, this is what you should be thinking about when you're drafting, everybody, is, this is a two quarterback, this, is IDP, this, one, this one might be worth. You know, so if you're at seven, you know, you're looking at, you know, in most drafts, whether you get one of the wide receivers or a high-end running back, you can come back around. So let's say the range of players available might include Jamar Chase, Eckler, Harris, Dalvin Cook, maybe even Cooper Cup, right? And, and possibly Justin Jefferson. But then you look at so, you know, it leaves you some options, you know, in regard to position. And then coming back around, I think there are good players at either position uh, if you're picking from seven 
uh, that you'd want to have, right? So whether it's so whether you go wide receiver first or running back first, coming back around, you could go wide receiver, maybe get CeeDee Lamb, maybe get uh, – I like Mike Evans an awful lot, but if you like Tyreek Hill or Debo Samuel better, that's all well and good, right? So yeah, I'd probably go with seven in this case. I do like the the ends, right? I, I like the one, two, or the 11, 12. I think I like the turns. Being on the tail end, I think makes me feel like I have to go a little more aggressive. Uh, you know, you might reach for players a little bit because you know they're not making a round. I think when I draft, the earlier I draft, the better I feel, mostly because you have that one of the, your top anchor players and you feel really confident. It gives me a lot of the feeling that I can be really flexible. The middle hasn't been my favorite, but in recent drafts, I've been getting it and I've had a great deal of success. So I probably, in, of, this, of this group, I'd pick seven. And for the reason is, and you should go through, uh, Stephen, and, and look at you know how you're, you know, do some mocks and, and work it out and check ADPs and, and try to figure out who you're going to have, not just the second round, but maybe the third rounds and fourth rounds as well. Uh, who are your top five in PPR overall? Uh, my current top five, uh, Scott Kobe, is uh, Jonathan Taylor, Christian McCaffrey, Derrick Henry, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. Uh, Harris and Cup, Mixon, uh, and Eckler are up next. Cook, Adams, I like Adams a little more than Stephon Diggs. You could, your mileage might vary. Uh, Fournette, round out my top 12. Is Pittman solidified as a top of round three pick in PPR? He seems to be. I mean, I think in the current NFC ADP, he's going 11, wide receiver 11. Let me see what the, what the pick that correlates with that is. I know, that, I know that's the number, is 11. Uh, let me see what I have for his overall ADP. Um, yeah, he's 27th, so third round, early third round seems about right. And that's where I've seen him go as well, Scott. Pedro! He finds himself picking Mark Andrews in the second round, choosing A.J. Brown or Pittman as the number one. Well, yeah. So this is yes. I've seen a lot of this as well. You know I'm in on Mark Andrews. <clears throat> and I'm okay. I'm especially okay with A.J. Brown right now. And I'm okay with Pittman. Look, the latest reporting is crazy, right? Off the hook good. Uh, the joint practices with Detroit this week, he's been a dominant force. Currently he has Matt Ryan's attention. And it does sound like Alec Pierce and Paris Campbell are guys that maybe we can pay a little of attention to late in drafts now. But Pittman is first and foremost. You know, we saw them rise last year. The target share was crazy. I think overall it was, I want to say, 24%. I'm spitballing here a little bit. But I know down the stretch it was over 30% uh, target share when it, the games mattered most for fantasy managers. So there's that. And that's great news for all of us. I think Matt Ryan will spread it out a little more. And there are some other talented players there. But remember Matt Ryan's history with his top receivers. Those players are always super productive. So. So, yes, I think, Pedro, that's an ideal start. If you get that, or you know, especially if you're in the middle, uh, you know, or a little closer, start maybe four, five, six, seven, somewhere in that range, coming back around, getting Andrews, going back around, and you'll find yourself with A.J. Brown. Often, I love A.J. Brown right now. Like, you know, I can remember on draft night, I was on Sirius doing the draft coverage, and Mike Dempsey asked me, is this a, a positive, a negative uh, for A.J. Brown, this trade? I, thought, I, thought, I think it's a wash, right? Because the – the Eagles have been very run heavy, right? Titans were very run heavy. I think the quarterback play, yeah, pretty much a wash. Although, look, Jalen Hurts for fantasy purposes is a much better play. I don't know that he's a vastly better passer. I don't know if we've seen enough to say that. We'll find out this year, though, because it does sound like they're going to pass a lot more. And I want to say uh, it was Jimmy Kempsey from the uh, phillyvoice.com. And I think the words he wrote were, just watching practices on a daily basis. A.J. Brown's going to get 11 billion targets, was what he said, right? Not obviously an exaggeration, but but boy, there's a, you know we know he's a great player. Injuries have been a limiting factor for him. Again, not going to get caught up on injuries. To finish my thought from earlier, if you go to current ADP and you look at the top 12 players, I think there's only four of them who have not missed time in their career, significant time due to injury. Those guys are all in their second or third year going into their third year. It's Jonathan Taylor. It's Najee Harris. It's Jamar Chase. And it's Justin Jefferson. That's all. And give them time. They'll get hurt too. Graham F. Hi, Bob. Hi, Graham. Picking third in a 10-team, uh, half-point PPR. I go wide receiver first. Who would you prefer at running back one round? Aaron Jones, Alvin Kamara, or Nick Chubb. As for running back two, Zeke or Connor. Like both those running backs, I lean towards Connor over Zeke, but I think they're both really solid plays as a running back two. Can't go wrong. I think maybe Connor has a little more upside as we saw last year because it's, you know, they he gets all those goal, 
go carries, right? So, and I don't see anyone usurping, usurping those at all. Um, but I'm fine with Zeke as well if that's what you get. I'm starting to feel a little better about Alvin Kamara, and not that I feel good about a man who beat somebody up, and apparently it was a severe beating. It's on video. That's the wild card here. The legal proceedings, though, are going to time out so that he doesn't face consequences this year. That's what it sounds like. The NFL Pro Football Talk dot com uh, reached out to the nfl and asked him about his status they could put him on the unpaid leave list but they haven't they said there is no change the history with the league has been they wait until there's resolution in criminal cases and then they take their take take action well if that's the case camara had a hearing scheduled for august 1st and this is like a preliminary hearing it's not even people showing up or the defendants showing up it's just the lawyers to do paperwork and talk about discovery and things like that. Talk to Drew Davenport, uh, the practicing defense attorney who also works for football guys and is a great auction and drafter, by the way. Uh, so I'm at the King's Classic in the Expo. He's fantastic. But the general belief is this thing got pushed out to October. That means the, like, the preliminary things aren't going to happen until then. And who knows? The defendants may not happen until well into next year. The wild card there is the videotape. The videotape comes out. We've seen this before. The NFL's personal conduct policy is more a public relations policy. And if they're catching a bunch of heat because the video came out and apparently it's bad, the police report kind of says what's all in it. They're, they're, the victim was down and stomped and and uh, Camaro was taking part of that, allegedly. So, I mean, that's a concern. I would probably, of these guys, prefer Camara, right? Uh, you know, I mean, that... There's running back one upside there. I think there is with age, with uh, with with Aaron Jones as well. But I want to highlight something Aaron Rodgers said uh, this week. Look, and we'll talk about those receivers at some point, I'm, I suppose, as well. But Rodgers said both Jones and Dylan could be 50 catch players as running backs. If that's the case, AJ Dylan going what three or four rounds later than is, is a pretty good value. Let me just look at that before I uh, say something really stupid. Um, but it's uh, so right now, Aaron Jones is running back 10 in NFFC, 12 team, uh, 18th pick overall. AJ Dillon has moved up to running back 24, but he's a 63rd pick overall. He's going in the fifth round. I mean, come on now. That's value. Also, uh, maybe you wait and you get that other piece of the, of the Packers backfield if you go Camara. But, you know, again, your risk tolerance levels are going to matter here if you're, or hell, your own personal moral compass. If you, I'm not drafting a guy who beat somebody up, allegedly. Okay, don't. There are other paths to choose, but that that is the direction I would go, and I think you're I think you're right. Getting one of those top wide receivers there would be great. Then going running back, running back two, you might get Zeke or Connor even a little later in a ten team. You might be able to get another receiver or tight end there. Victor Jones, great to see you as well. Can I talk about C.D. Lamb and what RB ones would you take before him? Sure, I will tell you all about that. Um, I like Lamb an awful lot, not as much as my radio co-host Mike Dempsey, who loves him as his wide receiver four. I have Lamb as my wide receiver six. Jefferson, Chase, Cup, Adams, Diggs, Lamb. Uh, the running backs I'm taking ahead, Taylor, McCaffrey, Henry, uh, Najee Harris, Austin Eckler, Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook, Leonard Fournette I would probably take ahead, and that's all. So there's that. Uh, Victor Jones, PPR. Yeah, I assume that, Victor. Uh, that's my assumption unless you say otherwise. Hello, Andrea. How are you? I'm catching up. I'm a little behind here. All right. Pedro, mixing and Swift in the top 10 over D. Dalvin Cook. I know crazy thoughts. No, not necessarily crazy. I think in Dalvin Cook's, in Dalvin Cook's case, it's definitely not crazy. Uh, my friend Lawrence Jackson Jr. over at NBC Sports Edge, he might have him number one. He likes him an awful lot. He's drafting him very early. I don't want to speak for him, but uh, go check his rankings if you want. Um, but he likes Dalvin Cook an awful lot. I like Dalvin Cook an awful lot, too. This is going to be a very good offense. Um, I do think, you know, the uh, the concerns about him with the injury issues, the history, it's kind of, again, trying to be injury agnostic here, but there has been some repeated issues with the shoulder. Uh, he's got the knee history. So, you know, if you're splitting hairs, that's where it comes into line, I guess, for me. Um, so there's that. Um and mix, you know, Swift, the Swift is the one that worries me a little bit, right? Because we've never seen him carry the full workload. It's been a little hit or miss, been kind of up and down. Uh, boom or bust, if you will. Last year, a couple games, 130 plus yards, and some games where he just disappeared and he gets hurt. He looks like he's in line for to do more this year. And the offensive line is going to be a big issue there, Pedro. So 
I think the offensive line is going to be much better. It's one of the best offensive lines in football. Why wasn't it last year? Well, because the starting five never played a single game together. In fact, I think they played 12 different combinations, and their top players were not available all year. So I like the offensive line an awful lot. I like the progression of this offense. So not crazy. Um, I'm probably going with – I have Mixon over Cook, uh, Swift slightly behind, and they're all in that same tier, so it's not crazy. And I've seen Connor go really high in drafts that I'm in because I have him ranked as my – Right outside my top ten, <laughs> I have. I look. I'm all in on Connor. I think you know, and I you know again. I think maybe this is a case where injury concerns are a thing. Uh, I have Connor as my running back nine right now, ahead of Swift, ahead of Javante Williams, ahead of Aaron Jones, ahead of Saquon Barkley. By the way, the Saquon Barkley is going off the hook. His ADP at the NFFC is like nine. And by the way, Scott Kobe said, hit the like button, please do, or dislike if you don't like anything you hear. Dislike me, but do subscribe. There's a button below. You will see it. You can hit it. It's the subscribe button. I'm going to be here every Saturday. Now that we get close to the season, get into the season, I will be answering your questions damn near every Saturday. We have some other things cooking here on the YouTube channel that we will share with you soon. And you're going to love them because I love them. And I think you love me. Well, maybe you don't. Go to footballdiehards.com as well. Log in. The August update draft guide is rolling. Tons of great content going up constantly. Tools, rankings, constantly updated. Everything you need to dominate your opposition. What are you waiting for? Why aren't you there now? Because you're watching me and I'm answering questions. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Bowie rocks. He does. I'm going to start singing David Bowie songs if you're not careful. If I get Lance in a 10-team redraft, do I need to take another quarterback like Cousins to hedge my bets? Or just watch the wire if things don't go well? Look, the Lance-Cousins duo is awesome. Right? Cousins is like a totally overlooked commodity. I want to say Matthew Berry had a great piece on his uh, 100 facts thing that, you know, the touchdown totals and the fantasy production have all been super high end. And that's what Mike Zimmer is the head coach. This is Kevin O'Connell bringing over the Rams offense. So I think that's a great combination. I would do that if you can do it in an affordable way. Right. And so I do like the upside of Trey Lance. Um, maybe I don't like it as much as some people in the industry, but I do like it. Right. So, you know, there's people I know that have him locked in well inside their top 10. I'm not there yet. I'd like to see a little more, but, like, that's the thing, and this is a perfect example. If you think he has that upside, and I do think he has that upside, right? If you think he has that upside, go ahead and draft that upside and then get a super solid player later, a Kirk Cousins. Matthew Stafford's going to the double-digit round of 10 team leagues. Derek Carr's going late. I could play with any of those guys, right? So, so yes, I think that is a great approach. Kind of call it the steady Eddie. You go for the upside play a little early, and then you get the steady Eddie a little later. You can do that the other way around, too, if you want. How quickly am I taking quarterbacks in two quarterback leagues? 10 team. 10 team, you have a little bit of leeway, but I'm still getting my first quarterback early, uh, MJK. And I think, you know, like you get the anchor quarterback and then you can come around. I've been going a little later on the second quarterback. I did in the Scott Fish Bowl. I waited to like, I want to say the fifth round and still got Jameis Winston, who I feel okay about to go with Justin Herbert, who I got early. But having that anchor and then seeing how it plays out, I think in a 10-team, I am in one of those right now. So let me tell you, it's also a full IDP. So, But that doesn't skew the early rounds. This is Gary Davenport's death match, Hellfire Club, the Fantasy Sharks IDP Showcase League. And so this is two quarterback league, 10 teams. Josh Allen went first. Second quarterback off the board did not go till the fifth pick. That's uh, Mahomes. I got Christian McCaffrey in the first round. Came around in the second round. Got Lamar Jackson. I think that's great value, but you want to see where you're drafting. I'm not against drafting quarterback in the first round. Then I waited until the fifth round to come back around to get Kirk Cousins as my second quarterback. Uh, and so I'm looking here, and we're in the middle of the fifth round, and 15 quarterbacks have come off the board. So maybe that helps you out a little bit, I hope. Love two quarterback fantasy football. At some point, a friend Marcus Grant over at NFL.com and NFL Network he talks about this. We were at the, on the panel at the Expo uh, talking about this. And at some point, we're going to figure out a way beyond Superflex or two quarterback leagues to make the quarterback's value in fantasy more commensurate with what it is in the NFL. And maybe it'll take some radical scoring changes. Until we do that, though, the two quarterback is a ton of fun. Pedro, as per the guest on Die Hard's radio show last night, Eagles wide receiver A.J. Brown and D. Smith labeled 1A and 1B like this. Uh, yeah, well... Yes, kind of. I mean, uh, look, I think I think it's a more clear one and two to me. Uh, the guest was Curtis Patrick from Rotovis. He's a very smart man. So I'm not being dismissive of what he says. But from what we've seen, and maybe that's because Devonta Smith's been hurt in training camp, right? He hasn't, we haven't seen a lot of him. 
And it's not a major injury. They're just being precautious. That's an Siriani term. Precautious. I would say cautious, but he's being precautious. Uh, so, like, I think I think Devontae Smith's been kind of overlooked in drafts because of all the buzz A.J. Brown's drawing. I don't think the value is bad on a, a Devontae Smith. I'm going to look at it now and share it with you because I think it matters. Um, Devontae Smith is going off as quarterback, as wide receiver, 38. So outside the top three, 79th pick overall. That's pretty good value. I think he'll be. I think he'll outproduce that level. Andrea, there's a question from Andrea. That's what I've been waiting for. Two pick, two pick, two 12 team PPR choice between McCaffrey, Eckler, or Jefferson. Then should I go running back, running back, or running back wide receiver? All right, so you know I'm going McCaffrey here. And if it wasn't McCaffrey and he wasn't available, and he will be, uh, I would take Jefferson ahead of Eckler. I haven't seen him go much at two, but look, you can see these wide receivers going at one and two. I've seen it various times in drafts, mostly in best ball where people are taking chances. And I think the only reason you don't draft one of these running backs one, whether it's Taylor, McCaffrey, your choice, is because you really love that wide receiver. Justin Jefferson, there's a lot to like about, right? We're projecting him for that Cooper Cup-like role in this Rams-style offense. Kevin O'Connell's bringing from L.A. to Minnesota. We're going to think they're opening things up, but the quarterback play will be sufficient. So there's a lot to like there. Still McCaffrey for me. Look, you know, <clears throat> I'm a little down on Eckler. I am on a little bit of an island with that. So wouldn't talk you out of that. McCaffrey, though, for me is clear cut if he's there. Remember, Andrea, if you take Christian McCaffrey, mitigate your risk, right? Make sure you get, you know, Deontay Foreman later. And we think that is going to be the handcuff. We think that's the guy that's going to get the bulk of the work. Chuba Hubbard's going to have a role, but we saw what Deontay Foreman did when he took over for Derrick Henry last year. This is a different offense, though, so be mindful. But more importantly, add some quality depth and be ready to play your waiver wire. Michael Judge, 14-man keeper, two flex, keeping Chase and Jefferson. Oh, my goodness, for third and fourth round. Probably taking Eckler with second overall. Do I reach with uh, Connor for the second round? For second running back or try for a third wide receiver at Keenan level? So I'd, I'd go Connor there. You know, if you have Chase and Jefferson, you know, locked in, and this is a 14 team, I'm probably going running back to that second pick. And I would love to have James Connor to go with that Austin Eckler pick you're going to make. If Ronald Jones gets cut, will CEH get another chance for goal line work? I think so. I think it's interesting, you know, kind of lost in the Isaiah Pacheco, you know, enthusiasm. And, like, I'm here for that. I love it. Good for him. Um, we'll see how realistic it plays out once we get there. I think some of that Pacheco love it goes back to Brett Veach saying, I think, just before the draft that there's a seventh-round pick who's going to turn into a 1,000-yard running back. I think he was speaking generically and not specifically about Pacheco, but also – Pacheco fits that bill. So, and he's looked phenomenal in camp, but so has Clyde Edwards Alaire from all indications. He's looked really good in camp. And the price is fantastic on Edwards Alaire. I was just looking at the ADP. Let me look. Let me look again, just to make sure I'm saying this correctly. Clyde Edwards Alaire is currently running back 26. So a running back three in a 12 team league. 75th player off the board. You're getting him in the sixth round. If I'm getting him at that price or even slightly higher. I think that's a reasonable expectation. Remember last year he came in and we didn't know, but he had come off gallbladder surgery and, you know, there were a lot of issues and he'd lost a lot of weight. I mean, he's been a kind of a perennial disappointment as a pro so far. So I think we're, I think this is a case where I'm trying to leverage that value and we'll see what Ronald Jones, what happens with him. A lot of talk that he might not make the final roster. We'll see. <clears throat> Maybe they trade him. Maybe somebody uh, gets value from him. If they drafted him already, but. But I'm the basic point, Mark, is yes, CH. I don't know if it'll be a chance for goal line work because it sounds like Pacheco's ideally suited for that. And don't forget, Jarek McKinnon's there, and 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 I think Andy Reid has a thing for Jarek McKinnon, right? And he looked really good in the playoffs last year. When it mattered most, who was on the field? It seemed like Jarek McKinnon. <clears throat> Brian Larkin in a half point PPR, 10 team league. When would you pick a quarterback and who would it be knowing Josh Allen would be gone in the second round? I'd be waiting. So one quarterback, one quarterback. I'd be waiting. I'd be waiting into the double-digit rounds, and I bet you'll get whether you like a Tom Brady. Where the hell is Tom Brady? Is this the oddest thing ever? I've like I was all in on Tom Brady until the absence. I've dialed back. Maybe it is the Mass Singer. I don't think so, but I mean, so the Mass Singer thing. Really? 
I think he's smarter than that. Think of the questions that would come up when it's revealed that he was on the mass Singer and the Bucks are sucking. Like, oh, wow. I don't think Tom Brady's putting himself in that position. Just me. Maybe he is. <clears throat> but I would be waiting, uh, Brian. I'd be waiting into the double-digit rounds looking for – I mean, you, you'll get Aaron Rodgers there. You'll get Chris, You'll get uh, Kirk Cousins there. You'll get Derek Carr there. You'll get a wide range of quarterbacks falling to, into that level. Scott Kobe wants to know about Cam Akers and how much I think Daryl Henderson will take from him. I'm of two minds here. And when I'm of two minds, I'm concerned, right? I mean, I can see the range of possible outcomes here that – one of which does not support Cam Akers being running back 17 that he's currently going in an NFC ADP. He's the 35th pick overall. <clears throat> I've seen him go way higher, and I feel much worse about him higher. I feel less worse about him here. I mean, like, you know, so Sean McVay, look, look to last year. I mean, it was one guy at a time, right? When Daryl Henderson was up and running, he was going. When he wasn't, Sony Michelle was the guy. You know, I, I think, and this is Lawrence Jackson talked about this too. He thinks that we're all getting a little overly concerned about the preseason talk, and maybe we are. Um, but uh, look, it's a good offense. Cam Akers, I know he didn't look good last year when he came back, but the workload was, for me, the thing I was looking at. I didn't expect him to be the old Cam Akers of old coming off an, AC, uh, an Achilles in just six months. I mean, that alone is unheard of. Then the workload he got, and they were pretty tough defenses. Granted, I would have liked to seen him been better, just like I would have liked to seen Derrick Henry do better against Cincinnati. Cincinnati was playing good defense at the end of the year, so so I'm a little I'm a little concerned, right? And I'm maybe maybe I'm avoiding him. Maybe Henderson is the play later in drafts. Um, but I do think you know if we look past the in the moment, the talk, Liam Cohen, the offensive coordinator, saying the same thing. They're trying to find ways to use both of them. I mean, the history tells you that they like to use one of them, and they use them hard. And so then it's up to Cam Akers to stay healthy. Andrew Buto, Bateman, Mooney, and Marquise, who's your preference? Who do I prefer at that stage in a half-point PPR? Probably slight lean to Marquise Brown, then Mooney, then Bateman. Maybe if you're concerned about DeAndre Hopkins' return, uh, I could Mooney would be fine. Bateman is a great value right now. I think he's going to be better than people expect. Remember, I know, you know, I know we all – feel like this offense never throws the ball. Well, that will come as news to Marquise Brown, even if he doesn't like this offense. He got 91 passes last year, so it's not like impossible. Mooney's going off as the uh, wide receiver 27, Bateman as the 28, Marquise Brown the 22. I'm not against any of these. If you're working the values, maybe I like Darnell Mooney the best at these prices. Bateman's a good price as well. I prefer Mooney and Brown to Bateman slightly, though. I'd like to see it first, right? I, and I know the Ravens, and I know people in Baltimore say he looks fantastic. They draft him with a first-round pick. So their, you know, their investment in him is pretty solid. And, uh, and obviously, their willingness to trade Marquise Brown uh, when he expressed uh, unhappiness with the scheme after catching 91 passes and dropping some. So not against Bateman. Maybe if you can get him way later or something, I would still uh, land him. But M Marquise, Mooney, and Bateman. <clears throat> And with the half-point PPR, maybe Marquise just a little bit gains a little more because of his scoring big play ability. Not that Mooney doesn't have that, but Marquise definitely does. Rob, non-PPR TD heavy draft. Do you think Pittman will score more points than Deontay Johnson and that going from six TDs to nine is a reasonable expectation? Yes and yes. Look, Deontay Johnson has been remarkable. I, you know, you look at all these receivers getting these high-end contracts. He's been, you know, that he didn't quite get. He got a slightly lesser contract. But his numbers have been right up there. I should uh, put them in comparison because I think I know them. Or I have them written down here somewhere semi-convenient that I can bring them up fairly easily. Let's see. Uh, let's see. This is this hinders me. His three season numbers compare favorably to the receivers of the receivers taken to the 2019 draft, including Marquise Brown, Debo Samuel, AJ Brown, DK Metcalf, and Terry McLaurin, all of whom received new deals bigger than his. Johnson's 254 catches ranked first among that group. His 2,764 receiving yards and 20, catch, 20 touchdown catches ranked fourth. And he's done that with semi noodle armed, uh, somewhat declining Ben Roethlisberger, and at times with Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges in 2019. And in kind of a dink and dunk offense. So, look, I, I'm not against that, but I do think Pittman is the ascending player here. And with the uncertainty, at least, at quarterback, I think that's a fair assessment there for you, Rob. And definitely the 6-9 to nine seems entirely reasonable. 
Uh, Pedro, glad we mentioned Acres. When do you start feeling comfortable picking him up during draft? I'm in a 12 team PPR league trying to 12 man PPR league trying to gauge his draft. Well, I mean, you know, I mentioned that a little while ago. What the uh, current ADP is, I see him going around there. I mean, I've seen him early in in early best balls. He was going in the first round. I thought that's ridiculous. Now that he's going down a little bit lower, I mean, running backs is 17, 35th pick. So tail end, you know, you might get him at the three four turn. That seems pretty reasonable. He's going to be your running back too, not your primary threat there unless you're going zero RB or waiting on RB and hammering the receiver value early. So I'm not against him there. For PPR, where am I drafting? D-Hop, Michael Thomas, and Godwin. Any hesitation with any of these three? Zero hesitation with Michael Thomas, who I will draft like a crazy fool. Maybe my most invested player in best balls. A lot of that is because early this offseason, he was going hell in double-digit rounds. People had uncertainty. I've been talking to the beat writers in New Orleans uh, since early this year, shortly after Sean Payton announced his retirement. And uh, and they've all had positive things to say. Look, he's still got to get on the field, and I'm not expecting 2019 Offensive Player of the Year level on uh, Michael Thomas. But, God, he was pretty good before that as well, right? I mean, it's, like expecting 100 catch Michael Thomas, I mean, that's not like a huge reach. I do like the values. Just looking at the prices on these guys here, uh, the current prices, so I have a, an idea of so I'm not steering you wrong. Michael, Chris Godwin is wide receiver 30. Thomas is wide receiver 31. I'm more comfortable with Thomas there. I think Godwin's going to be ready. The fact that he didn't open camp on Pup is pretty damn exciting. And uh, Hopkins, I mean, you know you're going to lose a third a third of the season, right? He's also getting older. The target share wasn't as high as I want. Marquise Brown is there. Zach Ertz is there. I could really talk myself out of DeAndre Hopkins. And I don't think I have many shares. Let's just look at his current ADP and see where he's at. He's right after those guys. He's wide receiver 36, 71st pick overall. So you're out there closing in on the sixth round. Again, I, guys going in that range that I might prefer, I might rather have Brandon Ayuk, who seems to be coming on. I might rather have Alan Lazard. And talked about this with Curtis Patrick last night. You know, I've talked about it on this these live streams and on the radio program on the regular. This is guy, Alan Lazard. 82nd pick overall. That's pretty late in a draft for a potential wide receiver one for a quarterback as high end as Aaron Rodgers. So like he's not, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be that, but the possible range of possible outcomes is really positive for him at that price point. So, uh, you know, so like, it's like I said, I might like Adam Thielen better. I like, might like Ayuk better. I might like Hunter Renfro better. Kadarius Tony, not so much. Christian Kirk, I might be more comfortable taking. I just don't have a lot of D-hop. Um, this is the last year of his contract. Will they keep him around? I do like some. So, what do I like about Hopkins? He's been at his best as a pro with a super speedy threat opposite of him. He has that now, Marquise Brown. So, there we have that. I think I've plumbed the depths of that a little bit. Good Lord. You got me all excited there, Graham F. Matt Donaldson. I have a we'll pick one in a 12 team PPR league. Any insights on pick at 24 25, at least in terms of going running back or wide receiver in general. So, Matt, I don't like to tell you to go a position in general. I like to tell you to go with the best player in general, especially at that, you know, at, the, at that three, four, 24, 25. Yeah. At that turn, I mean, I think you're getting there's some really, I've found some really good running backs there. I mean, there's some good value at that spot. Uh, let me just give you a range of players who might be available at the 24, 25 turn in that range. Brandon Cook, Samon Ross St. Brown at wide receiver. Darnell Mooney we mentioned. You might get Marquise Brown there. Gabriel Davis is right in that range. If it's really running back heavy, maybe Terry McLaurin falls down there. DK Metcalf, probably not. Uh, at the running back position, I think you're going to find, uh, for the most part, David Montgomery might make it that far. Uh, that's maybe a little bit of a stretch. A.J. Dillon will be there almost for sure. Josh Jacobs, Clyde Edwards-Alaire, Elijah Mitchell might be there. I like all those guys. I think all those guys are great for running back twos if you're drafting that spot. I do like the tail end because of that reason. I think there's a lot of value to be had. So um, so those would be – and, I would, again, go for the best player. Hi, Craig. I am doing great, man. What are your thoughts on Damian Pierce not playing last night? Is he already running back one in Houston? That's what the peoples are saying. All the kids are out there saying it. And look, he looked really good in the preseason game. Here's my concern about all these running backs is this Texans offense. They improved the offensive line. I don't know if it got a lot better. They were one of the worst rushing teams in football last year. And one of the reasons they drafted Pierce is that they were one of the worst rushing teams in football. Didn't have a lot of big plays. Maybe Pierce gives them some of that average, hell, 10 yards a carry, 9.8 yards a carry in the preseason opener. That, you know, 
I can remember a guy named Travis Jervy averaging 10 yards a carry and then never doing a damn thing in the preseason and never doing a damn thing over his course of time in Atlanta and Green Bay and San Francisco. So speed helps, but, but yeah, I do. I am. I think the price is right on him as well. So and I do think, you know, he is going to move into the, to the running back one spot, whether it's week one or week four or week whenever he's going to have a significant role throughout. Uh, Pierce is currently going as I spelled his name, right? That would be helpful. Uh, running back 38. 109th pick overall, and get him in the ninth round, eighth round, and that's pretty good value for me. So, yes, and I do think he's going to be the starter. John McClain from the Houston Chronicle has been covering this team a long time, and uh, I said, why not take Marlon Mack late in your drafts just as a, maybe a someone who can carry it for a little while? And John McClain said, in my John McClain expression, because he sucks. All right. Uh, do I have any, uh, let's see, what did I have here? Sam Bam, 68 thoughts on rookie running backs. Brees, Pierce, Algier, Pacheco, any others moving up? I think those are the guys on everybody's radar. Kenny Walker, of course. Kenneth Walker, third, had the hernia procedure. I think he should still be on your radar. They're saying it's not a sports hernia. They're not saying what the procedure is. Ian Rappaport reported it was a surgical procedure, but we don't know what. Look, I had hernia surgery, and I couldn't walk for about a year. No, I'm exaggerating, but it hurts anytime they're cutting into your core. So we don't know the exact nat nature of the procedure. They're saying he'll be ready week one. I think it's some kind of minimally, minimally invasive thing, guessing. So he would still be on my radar, although I'm a Rashad Penny stan, as everyone knows. So Brees, I think, is great. I think Pierce will be fine. Tyler Algier, you're taking your chances a little bit. Isaiah Pacheco, I think you are as well, because – like, you know, like early on, where is Pacheco going now in ADP? It's gotten a little off the hook. Yeah, he's going as running back 38. Um, round nine-ish. Cordero Patterson going right there with him. I'd rather take Cordero Patterson and take my chances there. But but like, I get it. If you if you set up your roster so you're drafting your running back four or five at that point, I think he's fine for that and you get some upside. Uh I'm fine with Brees. A lot of people don't think this Jets offense is going to be very good. I'm one of those people, and I still think Brees Hall could be a pretty good acquisition. So that was all cloudy there. Uh. Uh, anyone else moving up? Uh, on the, not really anyone else moving up. No one exciting me. And if I haven't thought of somebody, and I do as we're talking later, I'll let you know. Uh, Dave Gladstone wants to know if I have a favorite double-digit round quarterbacks with either a new offensive scheme or new talent, surrounding talent. Why are you asking a Derek Carr question without saying his name? <laughs> I think he's one of them, right? Uh, you know, obviously. I think you know, we mentioned Kirk Cousins. Uh, you know, look. So I'm looking at the current ADP. Derek Carr is quarterback 13, outside the starting range. Aaron Rodgers, a lot of new pieces around him. Quarterback 14, I'm good with that. Kirk Cousins, you know I love. I think the production is there. And if I'm going to go ahead and keep throwing out the uh, Matthew Berry numbers, let me just tell you what they are. Um, look them up real quick. I do think they're interesting. Uh, the list of quarterbacks who have thrown at least 30 touchdown passes each of the last two years, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, and Kirk Cousins. In the last two years, those same players are the only quarterbacks with more passing touchdowns than Kirk Cousins. Last year, Cousins was in the top four in NFL games with two-plus touchdown passes in games with at least 275 passing yards. It's a new scheme. This was under Mike Zimmer. I mean, you know, so I think there's a lot of lot to like about Kirk Cousins. And so, and also, let's get into some names I haven't mentioned because I think they bear mentioning and we should talk about some of them. Um, Tua Tonga Valoa, I mean, whether you think he's the most accurate quarterback ever in the history of the world or that he can't possibly connect on a deep pass. I don't know. There's two possible worlds there. By the way, he was second in the NFL in adjusted, uh, I want to say maybe even first, 55, 52, somewhere in that range on deep balls. But he only threw like 18 of them last year. Super accurate on the short passes, though, for sure. Uh, I think you could make an argument for Trevor Lawrence, professional coaching staff, going way later. I have a lot of investment in Jameis Winston as my quarterback, two in leagues. Matt Ryan appears to be on track to have a much better season. Um, and after that, I think you're taking your chances a little bit. So how about them apples? Uh, family Bohan, hello. Family Bohan wants to know, Michael Carter be a startable flex option? Thinking, thinking. I don't know. He could emerge as that. I'm, uh, so I think you should draft him later because I think you are going to get a little value on him. Let me look at the ADPs here and see if he is. But I do think, you know, I think we're, you know, 
I know Brees Hall is there, and I know he's going to be a heavy workload guy, but Michael Carter is also still there, and he's running running back 47. You're getting him in the 10th round. <clears throat> I think that's fair. I think I, I think I might take a speculative chance on him if my roster allows it. Scott wants to know how, uh, how I prefer to start drafts with zero running back or hero running back, or how has your philosophy changed from the last year's draft and draft season? Um, so I think I'm more of a hero, whether it's the first or second round. I want to have that anchor running back. But if I get him in the first or second round and I get four wide receivers or three wide receivers in a tight end, I think I feel pretty good about those drafts. And I know how you approach these things, Scott, because we've seen it in the mock drafts. And we'll do those more. More mock drafts coming that I'll be analyzing here on the YouTube channel. A lot going on in the YouTube channel. Coming days that you will hear more about. Also, you can hear me. If you don't know, I'm Bob Harris. If you're just tuning in, Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. You can hear me every night uh, heading into the season, Monday through Friday. I think next Friday I'm on at noon, though. I'm like, noon, solo show, Football Diehards. Uh, Dempsey will be on with Fabiano right after that. So I got some stuff going on Friday night. So... Also, go to footballdiehards.com, sign up for the August update premium service that takes you into the flash update, which is our regular season service. Tons of information, tools, rankings every single week, adjusted live in real time, right up to Sunday's kickoffs. A lot of good information there once you get into regular season. A lot of good information there now, damn it. Go. Also, hit the subscribe button here on the YouTube page uh, and hit the like button. I see many of you have liked me. No one has disliked me. Someone dis I'm going to dislike myself just because it makes me feel better. There, I did it. Ha. All right. How do I, okay, where do you have Burrow and Hurst ranks in six-point TD leagues? So I might be a little edgy on this. Uh, so I like Hurts a little bit. He's been growing on me, not as much as others, but I have him as my quarterback five. It's the rushing equity. I have Burrow right now at nine. Maybe he will rise up. I still have Stafford ahead of him. There are questions about Burrow and Stafford both. The elbow seems to be going away. Burrow is back on the field and looking good. But he lost some weight, right? And this is a little concern to me because even Joe Burrow talked about it. And this is something I mentioned with Kenneth Walker. They cut through your core. He had an appendectomy. His appendix burst. So it wasn't a laparoscopic procedure or some minimally invasive procedure. <clears throat> they had to cut him open. And they're cutting through your core muscles. Your core muscles are important to you when you're playing the position of a quarterback and making passes. So I don't want to overstate the case because I think it'll be fine. But if I'm splitting hairs, that's one of the hairs I'm splitting. I would rather have Hurts because he gives you that rushing equity. I know Joe Burrow is not totally immobile, and maybe he's more mobile this year than last year when he was coming off the ACL. But I like that what the Rich Rebar, uh, my friend at Sharp Football, calls the Konami Code quarterbacks. They give you that extra gear as a runner. All right. John Bonneville, I'll be a Saquon truther until he retires. Dude, is Barry Sanders, the quads the size of my entire body. These are all true. He's also on a horrible team. So I talked to uh, Chris, uh, I want to butcher his last name if I'm not looking at it, the Giant Insider last night <clears throat> and had this very conversation. Like, I'm a, I'm a little skeptical of him. Like, not totally skeptical, but what, he had three runs of 20 yards last year. He only had nine runs of 10-plus yards. I get it. The offensive line was horrible. We think the offense this year is going to be better. How much better is it? Like, they scored 23 touchdowns on offense last year. It's like the second worst in the league. At 15.2 points a game. It was a horrible offense. Offensive line wasn't great. It's already getting beat up again. So, like, I'm like I'm not against Saquon, and I do think he's probably a better player than we've seen, whether it's been health or just the supporting cast or the pieces around him. I do think this offense is going to be better this year. Do I think it's going to be great? I don't know. So, nine is a little rich for me, but John Bonneville, uh, if you win the title with Saquon Barkley, I congratulate you, sir. That's I mean, that's the thing. You know, everyone gets to like who they like. And, and we saw him as a rookie, what he can be. Uh, how can anyone dislike me? <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Very kind of you. Brian, would you stream a kicker and a defense in the league that, that costs $5 a transaction? I would find a kicker and a defense that I really like that has like a double-digit bye week and, and do it like that. MJK, thanks. Was looking at Lamar in the second two. Cats are well, sir. Adam Thielen will lead the NFL in receiving touchdowns. You can cuff him with KJ Osborne. Are you crazy? Um, not totally crazy, kind of semi-crazy, semi right? So there are numbers here, and I shall share them with you because I like to do that in these cases. I just needed to bring them up for you. So since 2020, when Justin Jefferson arrived, Thielen's overall targets per game, they've dropped, but his scoring totals have risen. 
Only two NFL receivers have caught more touchdown passes than Thielen, who has 24 since the start of the 2020 season. Devontae Adams with 29 and Mike Evans with 27. Last year when he got hurt, I want to say in week 10, he was wide receiver seven in fantasy. So, no, you're not totally crazy, young man. Pedro, something to think about as per Die Hard's draft book magazine, the Swiss rushing schedule is juicy. That is true. Add an excellent offensive line. These are all fair points, right? <clears throat> not going to argue against you. And this is the thing, right? I mean, especially, you know, I, you know, some people only draft in tiers, right? Some people only rank in tiers. Some outfits out there, JJ Zach Reeson only ranks in tiers. We're ranking linear, linearly. Most of us do, right? <clears throat> but like pretending in advance, we can predict the future with the granularity that says DeAndre Swift is going to be less productive than another guy in his tier. Well, that's silly. We can't do that. So if you think he can, it's perfectly reasonable, right? So, and, and ADP does come into play on that too. If you're getting one a little cheaper and you think he's better, dive on that. <clears throat> okay, current ADP that I'm avoiding. Rob T wants to know, yes, I just did a podcast with this, the 4 for 4 podcast with my friend, friends John Daigle and uh, John Paulson. And we talked about players. Saquon Barkley's one I'm not getting a lot of his ADP. No offense. I don't want anything by it. Um, but yeah, I'm not getting a lot of him. Um, who else am I? I'm not getting a lot of Tyree kill right at the upper end. There seems like some volatility there and there are players I like, and this is the key here. There are players I like at the same price point. I like Mike Evans a little better. I'm perfectly fine with AJ Brown. So, and I get it. Tyree kill one of only six players to, uh, with touchdowns. I want to say at least six touchdowns in each of their six seasons or one of only four. I think I'm one of only four. He's very good, right? And maybe he'll be very good, but it's a new thing. And I get edgy about new things. Um, who else am I not drafting a lot of, not getting a lot of, I'm not getting a lot of Austin Eckler because I'm drafting, I like other players better than him and he's going earlier. And that's a lot of it. I think not out there trying to hunt down Javante Williams at the running back 11. Maybe he outproduces that. Look, if he gets a full, more robust workload than we expect. And Melvin Gordon did say he's going to be a guy that, that the coaches want him to be the guy yet. Melvin Gordon is still there. Uh, so I don't have a lot of him. Don't have a lot of Antonio Gibson at any price. He concerns me. And he's been really productive the last couple of years. But man, the way this situation is playing out, I'm a little concerned about him. At wide receiver, some of the guys I'm not getting besides Tyree Kill, probably not getting a lot of Jalen Waddle for the same reason. Uh, don't find myself drafting much of uh, Amari Cooper for the obvious reasons. Not I'm kind of avoiding DeAndre Hopkins at this point. Uh, tight ends I'm not getting a lot of would include uh, Dalton Schultz, and I'm probably totally wrong on this one, so please feel free. Uh, I like Zach Ertz a little later. That's the only reason why. Dawson Knox pretty touchdown dependent, so I don't have a ton of him. So those are some of them. There's a lot. Go look at my rankings. FootballDiehards.com. Got a few more minutes. I'll try to get through some more of these questions. Uh, da, 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 da. Are you taking who – are, who am I taking five overall in a 14-team? Assuming Cup, Jefferson, J.C. Mack on right now. I'm leading Chase. I would take Chase for sure at that point. I uh, would consider Harris as well. It's 14-team. Running back's a little more valuable to me, you know, a little more positional scarcity there in a 14 team, but but Chase would be hard to pass up on. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And thank you for coming to the show. I appreciate everyone for showing up. I'll be here every Saturday, noon Eastern time. Let me see if I can raise through a few more of these questions before we call it a day. Brett Monson wants to know Dynasty Keeper League, five, Aaron Rodgers, Kirk Cousins, keep five. Joe Mixon, James Robinson, Miles Sanders, Devin Singletary. You've given me 14 players to choose five. You narrow that down. Narrow it down to seven, and I'll choose five. How worried am I about the Tampa offense this season, if at all? A little bit. Offensive line concerns are an issue. I think everything will get normal. But, dude, again, this is the oddest thing, this Tom Brady going away. Right? It's just hard for me to wrap my head around. It just seems so un-Tom Brady-like. Brett, narrow it down for me, man. Just found out my league is going fab instead of number priority for waiver. New to this format, any new site for a cover with fab. Um, there are two schools of thoughts. I'm in the latter school of thought. The first school of thought is, man, when somebody rises up, go ahead and pay for them early. I tend to hold on to my resources until later in the season because I think I'm going to be more in need then. So and I play more first come, first serve. If a player rises up, like last year it was Elijah Mitchell, right? And everyone was all over him. I was a little skeptical. I missed out, right? So you can miss out on these guys. But also, when the late season player emerges, and maybe Rashad Penny's running wild and 
you'd like to drop the hammer. I like to have a little money laying around for them as well. Bob, the Jets are going to surprise me. Oh, Rob, I'm sorry, Rob. Rob Dreyer, I'm drafting number two in a 12-team half-point PPR, taking McCaffrey or Taylor, considering a stack with Lamar Jackson and Andrews. Like that, when in this, when I run this in mock drafts, Bateman keeps coming up crazy to three stack. No, it is not. Not crazy. As long as it happens organically and works with the rest of your roster. I'm all for it if it happens like that. Um... And Brad, I'm, you know, I'm no mean to slack off. And if I have time, I'll try to circle back to you. But that's getting 14 players to choose five. You got to do some of the work, man. Hello, Remy. The Jets are going to surprise me. Uh, their schedule is crazy hard for the pieces there for progress. They are. Offensive line willing. Zach Wilson willing. Or maybe Brian. Maybe the elite quarterback, uh, Joe Flacco. Outlook on the Philly backfield is, uh, I think Kenny Gainwell is the guy to have there. You're getting him a little later. Miles Sanders told us not to draft him. I'm going to listen to him. He's a little beat up. Look, two years ago, he looked like the best playmaker in this offense, and now they just don't seem to like him as much as the rest of us, uh, and that worries me. Thank you, bro, Dave. I appreciate that. Saquon is going to buckle under the pressure this year, guaranteed. We shall see. Staying far away from him. Are you crazy? I'm with you. I'm with you at the price. Like, if he was cheaper, I'd be fine, but it's too damn much. Planning to mock? Uh, yes, we will do some two-quarterback mocks, for sure. Any insider info at Stafford's elbow? Not really insider, but it does sound like it's getting better. Um, and I think, you know, like a lot of these things we see in the, the, the exhibition season, in the month of August, man, they get blown up, right? It's just that time of year. We are all focused on it. We're intensely paying attention. We're really worried because we're investing in these people. All these things are, you know, true. And, and so we tend to overblow these things. He says he's going to be fine. I think he's going to be fine. That's not to say, man, you know, having an entire off season to get this thing better, you got the platelet rich plasma treatment that's supposed to promote healing and maybe didn't. So, you know, there are concerns, but I'm, I'm, I've drafted them a lot, a lot, because I think the price is right and I'm more greedy than I am worrier. So there's that. Ricardo Flores, 14 man league, drafted Chubb, Mixon, Pittman, Sutton, Hawkinson. Well, you did pretty good there. That's a pretty good draft. Chubb and Mixon. I hope in that order, Pittman, Sutton, Hawkinson. Love this. Love those wide receivers. I like Sutton an awful lot. Hawkinson, Ramondre Stevenson. I got taken to task on Twitter because of something I said on the radio about him that was totally mistaken. I didn't say it. It was kind of joking about Harris. I draft all the Harrises, right? Damian Harris. I do have more shares of Damian Harris, but clearly Ramondre Stevenson's on the rise given the retirement of James White, et cetera. Melvin Gordon, Elijah Moore, great playmaking threat. Cole Komet, I have a blind spot for, and I should probably like him more than I do. Russell Gage, I think is great. That's a great draft, man. Good job, Ricardo. Jimmy's in a keeper league. Two keepers, uh, uh, Chase in the sixth, Jefferson in the ninth, and have 12 way pick. I would probably, boy, I would be tempted to go with that zero running back strategy. And, you know, maybe it depends a little bit on who the running backs are, who I think are going to be waiting for me. Maybe Kamara is a little bit risky if you have worry that that video is going to come out. If not, I'd be fine taking Kamara there, but I'm not against that zero RB. I bet Scott Kobe would agree. Here we go, Brett Monson. Thank you. I appreciate that, man. The list is too much. Aaron Rodgers, Kirk Cousins, Michael Thomas, Amari Cooper, Robert Woods, Devin Singletary. See you later. Uh, I want to say Devin Singletary for sure is out. Yeah, Devin Singletary, I throw out. Uh, you could argue Woods. I think Cooper will be fine. Maybe not this year. Maybe going forward. All right, I'll get one more question in here before I call it a day. And by the way, thank you, Ricardo. I appreciate the kind words. Very good of you. And if you didn't get the magazines and people you're into them, the Pro Forecast, 33rd year, Football Diehards magazine, the draft book, or the cheat sheets, all available for order at footballdiehards.com. I know the season is getting near, but you will have them well in advance of the season. A lot of good evergreen information in there. Uh, Larry Blake wants to know how I'm feeling about Raheem Mostert in general. I think he's a great value. And, you know, what are the odds that he ends up being the leading back in Miami? Not zero. Well, well above zero. I knew Scott Kobe would. Thank you, Andrea. All right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming. That was a good time. I love that. I want to do this like this every week. Lots of questions, lots of information to get out there. Hope you all appreciate it. Again, hit the subscribe button right below me here on the YouTube. Use the notification bell if that works for you. Uh, hit the like button. It helps the algorithm. Hit the dislike button if you don't like me. I'm okay with that. Thick skin. It's okay, man. Um, and go to footballdiehards.com. Check out all the latest, the August update draft guide. Up and running right now. Constant flow of information, tools, rankings, stats, everything you need 
to dominate your opposition. We'll carry that into the regular season with the uh, flash update. Use the promo code DIEHARDS to get a discount, everybody. I insist. And also listen to me on the uh, Series 6 M Fantasy Sports Radio. This coming week, I will be on 8 to 10, Monday through Thursday. Then Friday, come check me out at a weird time. I'm on at uh, noon Eastern time. Football DIEHARDS. Well, I'll be solo. Mike Dempsey will be on with Fabiano and the Fantasy Dirt Hour. And then we'll go forward from there. The season's drawing near, people. Goodbye.